All right, why don't we get started here? <clears throat> How many of you were just at Jim Weirich's talk next door? And how many of you, if you had the choice, would choose to speak after Jim Weirich? <laughs> Damn you, David Black, wherever you are. <laughs> so anyways, my name is Eric Ivancic, and I do offer Ruby and Rails training through LearnRuby.com. But I think as many of the people I've uh, heard speak here and have met here, I have a mix-in model of my history. I have a computer science background, but in graduate school, I studied neural models of learning and memory. And as a result, I covered quite a bit of cognitive psychology and even helped co-teach some of the courses on cognitive psychology. So I have a background in that as well. And when I was trying to think of a talk that I could offer all of you, um, it occurred to me that I could go in that direction because it was somewhat unique among the Ruby community. So that's where I come from. Now, who is this talk for? Did cognitive psychology actually study Ruby programmers? No, not yet as far as I know. But we know a lot about humans, and of course, programmers are humans, and Rubyists are programmers, and so much of the knowledge we have about humans can be applied to Rubyists as well. And there are some things that are a little bit special about Ruby and along the way, so I'm going to try and tie those into these themes as well. And I hope to have time to cover all three of these, but I want to cover effectiveness, creativity, and if we have time, teaching others. And if I kind of squeeze a little bit in, I think I can cover that as well. How many of you are familiar with the term life hack? Okay, it turns out that that term has undergone a change in meaning over time. Originally it referred to uh, a programmer who had written a set of quick and dirty shell scripts and other utilities uh, that filtered and munged data and processed data into streams and so forth. But it has come to actually mean something a little bit different. Anything that solves an everyday problem in a clever or non-obvious way might be called a life hack. So some of the things I'm going to be talking about have a life uh, hackish quality to them in that they are non-obvious. At least I don't think they're obvious to the uh, most people. So let's go start talking in terms of effectiveness. Now, there is a condition that you might term mental fatigue, and probably many of you have had experience with it. But it's a case where you're easily distracted, you struggle to follow an extended line of thought or reasoning, and you have difficulty making or carrying out plans. Okay? How many of you have had that experience at some point in their life? Okay? All of us, probably. We're humans. Now, the first thing I want to make a distinction of is that mental fatigue is not the same thing as stress. Stress is a reaction to harm or a threat of harm. And it's associated with an increased heart rate, elevated blood pressure, sweaty palms, cortisol in your brain, and so forth. That's not the topic of my talk here. That stress is not a good reaction. Cortisol is actually a neurotoxin. Um, and you want to avoid it as much as possible. So avoid stress. But I'm going to talk about something else, which is mental fatigue. And People have known for quite a while that people can become mentally fatigued, but they weren't quite sure what is being fatigued. Is the entire brain being fatigued, or is it some small component of the brain? And one of the great insights into this was from an American uh, psychologist named William James, who uh, uh, wrote a series of books in the late 1800s. Um, and one of the books he wrote was Psychology of the Briefer Course, which was released in 1892, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And believe it or not, this psychology book is used as a textbook today in some psychology courses, all right? Because the insights are really fantastic. And even though it's been more than a century since he wrote these things, they're still applicable today. And one of his insights in this particular book was that there are two basic kinds of attention. The first what was what we would call in modern days fascination, okay? These are exciting events that draw our attention to them or interesting tasks that we uh, are, are obviously draw our attention, okay? There's another kind of attention as well called directed attention. And this is the attention we use to push through difficult or boring tasks, to make decisions with a lot of complex considerations, and also to work in distracting environments. Excuse me. And in some ways, these two kinds of attention are opposition, at least in some circumstances, in that we use directed attention 
to kind of minimize or inhibit our fascination of certain things. So if we're in a distracting environment and there's something interesting going on here, but we have to get our work done, we will use directed attention to inhibit that impulse to actually look and see what else is going on in the room. Okay? So, and there are a number of distinctions between these two kinds of attention. Fascination is automatic, all right? It happens. It's, in some ways, it uh, has an evolutionary background. Things that were meaningful to our survival and to our well-being are going to be fascinating. Things dealing with violence, death, high emotions, sex, and so forth, those are all fascinating. As well as things that we learn, which we come to find as fascinating. So, for example, if I were to hear somebody whisper behind me, especially if they were whispering my name, it would be hard for me not to start paying attention to that. Okay? Directed attention, though, is subject to voluntary control. We can decide what we want to attend to. Fascination is effortless. Uh, directed attention, though, is effortful. All right? It takes effort to actually use it and block the other things out. And the third difference is that where fascination is robust, directed attention is subject to fatigue. That is, the more we use it, the harder it is to employ shortly thereafter. And it's come to be thought of as a resource model, where the resources might be some neurotransmitters uh, in the brain. But we have a, a certain amount of capacity of that uh, resource. And as we have demands for it, we use it and the level goes down. When there are times when we're not using it, that can be replenished. Okay? The challenge comes is that when we're using a lot of it, and we deplete this resource quite a bit, and that makes directed attention hard to use. And that is what we're talking about as uh, directed attentional fatigue. Okay? And there is evidence that this is a depletable resource. And I want to go through these experiments a little bit quickly. In one, they approach shoppers in the mall and ask them questions about, are you making important purchases? You know, are you giving these purchases a lot of consideration and so forth? They're trying to figure out how intense the decision making was in their purchases. And once they got a sense of that, and also how tired they felt, then had them do a lot of math problems. And what they found is that people who had to make a lot of decisions were worse at the math problems and gave up sooner than those who had not made a lot of decisions or more intense decisions. Okay? In another experiment, um, people were either put in a choice or a non-choice category. In the non-choice category, they read through some requirements for a college degree read through some course listings as what would fulfill the requirements, and that's all they had to do. The people in the choice condition, though, also had to decide which courses they would use to fulfill each of the requirements. And then they, uh, um, then they, there was a studying task. They could study for a test that they were told was very predictive of their future success. And from the people who made the choices, and they were in the choice condition, gave up earlier on the, on the studying for a test. Okay? Again, the, the process of making all these decisions made it more difficult to actually focus and study. There's also another experiment, which is actually kind of funny, but I don't want to go into all the detail, but people were told they were doing a, a test on, on taste. And there were two displays of food in the room. One was a stack of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies that were actually baked in the room, so this room smelled of chocolate chip cookies, also embellished with a few chocolates. The other was a display of radishes. And people were split up into two different groups. There's actually a third non-food group altogether. And so, some were told that they had to try to eat at least two cookies, and then they would uh, come back and uh, do something else, the, the, the experimenters. Others were told that they couldn't eat the cookies. They had to eat the radishes instead, to at least two of the radishes. And that they would do a test as well. Experimenter comes back and gives them a very difficult test and times how long it takes for them to give up on the, on, the, on the test. And the people who had to resist the cookies took less time to give up than the people who had to resist the radishes. Okay? So again, the ability to resist something seems to be depleting a resource which is used in doing a very difficult task. And so the basic idea here is that what you might call mental fatigue is actually a fatigue of directed attention which is used in these various things. Here is a list of some of the times where you rely on directed attention. Getting through boring and tedious tasks, working despite distractions, maintaining an extended line of thought, analyzing, planning, deciding, problem solving, thinking carefully, working through difficult, complex, or abstract problems, multitasking, merely tracking multiple things, 
navigating complex social interactions, and it looks like the bottom is cut off here, but that's as inhibiting natural or habitual responses. Okay? Think in terms of the modern office. All right? Many of those things are used on a regular basis in the modern office. Now, think in terms of programming. Okay? And many of those very same things are used all the time when you're programming. Okay? So programmers, I believe, have additional demands on the directed attention as part of their day-to-day -day activities. And especially when you think about working through difficult, complex, or abstract problems, in Ruby, we have a lot of different levels of abstraction that we can go to. We can think in terms of meta classes, in terms of closures and procs and things like that. So I think the demands for Ruby programmers can, at times at least, be a little bit more demanding than programmers in general. All right? So we have these two kinds of attention. And I already mentioned that one interaction between the two is when we're in distracting environments and directed attention has to inhibit the fascinating stimuli. Okay? But another interaction is with people who program and who actually enjoy programming. And I imagine most of the people here who decided to come to a conference on Ruby actually enjoy programming in Ruby. And in that case, fascination direct attention can have a very detrimental interaction in that the fascination keeps us programming more and longer, consuming more and more directed attention, making fatigue even more likely. Okay? And the consequences of directed attention fatigue are pretty severe. You're distractible, you have difficulty making carrying out plans, a disinclination to reflect and think reflectively, a bias towards acting rather than thinking, risky and impulsive action, and mistakes. All right, you don't want the pilot of your aircraft to be, suffer from directed attentional fatigue. And there are various ways to test how well you're doing on directed attentional fatigue, one of which is the Necker cube, which is a uh, two-dimensional stimuli which actually has two different three-dimensional interpretations. And in our mind, we have two representations, one for each one, and those representations compete with each other to see which one is the most active at any given time. So one representation has this as the front face, and the other has that as the front face. And basically one, one of those representations wins the competition and is the one, how we view that particular cube for a while, but eventually it fatigues out and the other one can come up and replace it and you'll see a flip if you look at it long enough. Then eventually this one gets fatigued and this one's now recovering and so they'll flip again. They can keep flipping back and forth. And in order to test directional attentional fatigue, what you can do is you can tell somebody Try and hold on to your current um, representation for as long as possible and to resist the flip. All right? And what you do is you have to take a measurement of somebody when they're not fatigued, and when they're fatigued, they have a much more difficult time resisting the flip, and it'll flip on a more regular basis, even though they're trying to keep it from flipping. The, the gold standard, though, for testing rational attentional fatigue is called digit span backwards, where you're given a set of digits serially, one after the other. And then you're given a ghost signal and told that you have to repeat that sequence backwards. Okay? So let's try it with all of you. Okay? Now, you can't write things down or type things in. That would be cheating. It's all done in the brain. All right? And we'll do something simple with only three digits here. And backwards? Okay? Now, normally what you would do is you would go start at three, then you'd try four, and every time they got one right, you'd bump up the length of the sequence by one with different digits each time. If they fell at a given length, they get a second chance at it. If they fell a second time, then you know what their limit is at that particular point in time. Let's, we're not going to go through the whole sequence, so let's try it at seven. Okay, seven is pretty difficult. Okay. <laughs> you are you do not suffer from direct attentional fatigue, whoever you are. <laughs> All right. Generally, five, six, um, you know, if people have a, a, a trouble at four or five, it might indicate some fatigue problems. But and, and it's hard to go up six and seven. That's pretty difficult. There's a trick with that. There's a trick? Yeah. And the, 
Right, so in that way you're undermining the value of the test. Maybe afterwards if we have time you can tell us what the trick is because I'm curious. All right, now there is a whole uh, set of literature on attention restoration theory which is what you can possibly do to restore your attention. And the basic premise is that you choose activities and environments that require little directed attention and promote replenishment of that resource. And the, re and the environments which are good at this are environments that are fascinating, especially quiet fascination, which doesn't kind of, it's not in your face, but is interesting, but gives you room to think as well and maybe resolve some th certain things. Being away into a different environment is very helpful. Environments that are rich and provide lots to see and lots to do are very helpful. And also compatibility. Uh, an environment that requires few challenges or struggles is very helpful. And the one kind of environment which has all of these things in spades is the natural environment. Okay? Now, of course, you have to choose your natural environment. If you're going to climb a cliff, that is not a very compatible environment. But walks through the woods or by streams or fishing and things like that are very compatible. And there's a lot of evidence that spending time in these kinds of environments does, in fact, help. Uh, let me quickly go through a few studies here. One took three groups of people, those who took urban vacations, those who took wilderness vacations, and those who took no vacations at all. Okay? They were given a proofreading task early on, before any of these two went on vacation. The vacations happened, and they took another proofreading task after they came back. Those who had no vacation still had uh, two tests at, at that interval. And they found that only the vacationers who went to wilderness vacations had a, a significant improvement on their proofreading capabilities. Another study uh, took uh, participants and randomly assigned them. Half had got to walk in a wilderness or natural setting for a certain amount of time. The others had to walk in an urban setting for the same period of time. Prior to taking the walks, they each did a task which was very draining on directed attention. And when they came back from their walks, they did uh, another proofreading task. And those who uh, went, on the went on the walk in a natural setting did significantly better than those who had to took a walk in an urban setting. And perhaps one of the more profound studies was done on breast cancer patients. Now, breast cancer patients, when they're diagnosed, their life changes in a very dramatic way. All right? They have to make decisions about treatment. They have to make decisions about whether to keep on working or maybe take some time off. They're worrying about what's going to happen afterwards if the treatment's not successful and so forth. And in fact, even those, these, by the way, were uh, all people who went uh, and had surgery to, to resolve their breast cancer. Um, even after they leave the hospital and have a clean bill of health, the effects are long lasting. There are typically marital troubles afterwards and they take a long time and some of them never actually return to all their prior activities. Okay? So Bernadine Simprich uh, speculated that perhaps they were suffering from directed attentional fatigue. And what she did is she had a control group where she didn't uh, give them uh, do, do what I'm about to tell you and a, and a, um, a research group. And the research group had to read through a list of restorative activities and they had to sign a contract where they would do one of those activities three times per week for 20 minutes each time. That was, their, well, that was what their contract said. They did this for 12 consecutive weeks. And over the 12 weeks, they were tested at four different times on the directed attentional fatigue. All right? And here's what she found. First of all, all participants showed significant attentional deficits right after surgery. But the restorative group showed gradual and steady improvement over 12 weeks in attentional measures. And by the way, most of the patients chose either gardening or walking through a natural setting. That was their, um, that's what they chose to do. Those in the restorative group went back to work sooner and were more likely to go back to work full time. They were more likely to start new projects like learning a new language or exercising and things of that sort. And they significantly better improvements in their quality of life scores. And realize that these are rather dramatic results where people have been through quite a bit. And think of how minimal the intervention was. 20 minutes, three times a week. So that is my bit on effectiveness and the role of natural environments can play in being effective and, and combating directional attentional fatigue. The next area I want to discuss is creativity. And what I mean by creativity is kind of related to problem solving, finding non-standard solutions or putting together complicated solutions. 
maybe rethinking previously made decisions, or of course the thinking outside the box. Now before, all of this is on the premise that you know the problem space, that you're an expert in the problem space, okay? Um, Nobel laureates, if any of you have the fortune of being a Nobel laureate at some point in your life, especially in the science fields, one problem you're gonna face is that once you are a Nobel laureate, you will receive letters and emails, even phone calls from crackpots having their solution to some big problem in your field. You have to decide what you're gonna do with all those people, whether you're going to ignore them, write them back some standard form letter or what, okay? Or another area where, where people who don't quite know the full space is there was a while ago when people had their own solution for the spam problem. And somebody created a checklist that they could quickly check off and tell them what was wrong with their particular solution that they had not yet considered. So first you have to kind of know the problem space. But assuming you do, what can you do to promote creative thought? Now, Peter Elbo wrote a book called Writing with Power. And as you, you know, there's, the, there's a standard view of the, of the writer, especially if you go back about a couple decades, at the typewriter with a waste basket, basket near him or her with a pile of crumpled up papers uh, flowing outside of that, that waste basket. Writing can be very, a very difficult process. And Peter Elbow analyzed it and he decided and advocates that there are two distinct processes in writing, all right? He says, writing calls on two skills that are so different that they usually conflict with each other. One is creating, one is criticizing. First, write freely, he says, and uncritically, so that you can generate as many words and ideas as possible without worrying about whether they're good or not. Then, turn around and adopt a critical frame of mind and thoroughly revise what you have written. Take what's good, throw away what's bad, and shape what you have into something that's strong. And he claims that you'll discover that the two mentalities needed for these two processes, an inventive fecundity and a tough critical mindedness, flower when they get a chance to operate separately. All right? So he views it as two distinct modes, creativity and criticality. But I'm gonna raise the issue as to possibly whether this is more of a continuum, okay, as opposed to two distinct modes of thought, which are difficult, though, to do at the same time. And one of my personal interests is, in, is, is how cognition, which is thinking and emotion, interact. And for a long time, people thought that cognition and emotion were two distinct realms of thought entirely. Cognition was rational and emotion was irrational and that you should avoid emotion and think non-emotionally about things. And as time has gone on, people have more of a, a subtle model of how these two things interact. I'm gonna use the term affect. Now, effect and affect are often confused. Effect is typically used as a noun, affect as a verb. But I'm going to use this bottom form of the word affect, which is a noun, which means emotion or desire. And the reason why is I don't trust myself to, to edit myself and use the word emotion each and every time. So I'm going to probably use the word affect, which means emotion, and just realize that I'm meaning emotion when I use that particular term. But as far as examples of affect go, there's positive affect, things like love, happiness, connectedness, humor, appetite. And there are also examples of negative affect, sadness, fear, shame, disgust, and hunger, okay? And generally, positive affect, in fact, pretty much always, is pleasurable, and negative affect is painful, all right? So we have the pleasurable emotions and the painful emotions. And we wanna see how cognition and affect uh, interact. And as it turns out, cognition can affect how you feel, and how you feel can affect how you think. All right, let's quickly look at that top arrow there. How does uh, what you think about affect how you feel? One way is that the things you think about have affective codes. Some things that you think about are pleasurable, others are painful, okay? I'm gonna show you a sequence of, of photos here, each of which is designed to elicit an emotional response from you, okay? So the things you think about can affect the way you feel. 
Not only does the stuff you think about affect the way you feel, but how you're thinking about them affects the way you feel as well. This is what we make a, usually a distinction between content and process. So let me get things set up here. So when you're confused, when you can't quite get a handle on what you're trying to think about, that's painful. All right? When you're bored, that is also painful. All right? When you're relatively clear about things, you kind of know which path you're going to be on, that's either neutral to mildly pleasurable. When you're actively exploring and, and you, you have a few options that you want to check out and you're not quite sure which one's going to be the right one, but you feel like you're closing in on a resolution, that's pretty pleasurable. Okay? And when you have one of those rare eureka moments, that can be intensely pleasurable. Okay? It's short-lived, the pleasure, but it's very intense. All right? So how you think also affects how you feel. But how you feel also affects how you think. Okay? And let's talk about that. How does affect influence cognition? First of all, there's been a lot of experiments in this area. And again, it's pretty easy to change how people are feeling. Here are some of the ways that in experiments they've induced uh, participants to feel one way or the other. By listening to different kinds of music, by watching videos, by reading a happy or sad story, by recalling or writing down a happy event or a sad event from their own personal history, or in the uh, positive effect case, giving someone an unexpected gift usually has a, a pretty powerful impact on, how they, on, on their positive affect. Um, how does positive affect influence how you think? Okay. Um, in some sort of experiments, they found that people who had positive in fact, uh, affect induced used and created categories more inclusively. They included more things as part of a category than they might otherwise, or especially than those people who had negative affect induced. They were more likely to rate low prototypic exemplars as being members of a category and a greater likelihood of coming up with unusual word associations. Positive affect also changes problem solving. People in the state of positive affect um, have better performance on a task that's generally regarded to require creative ingenuity than people who have negative affect induced. Also within problem solving, um, when they had pairs of subjects who were put in oppositional negotiating roles, if they induced positive affect on them beforehand, it reduced the use of contentious tactics. They looked for joint benefits in the potential solution, and the solutions that they found were more integrative. They brought more aspects into them, making them better solutions than those who had negative affect induced. And as far as decision making goes, um, people who had positive affect induced are less likely, they come to the same decisions often that people who have negative affect induced, but they do so more quickly because they're less likely to review information already reviewed, they're more likely to ignore information considered unimportant, and they're more likely to eliminate choices that did not meet certain important criteria early on in the process. Okay? So positive affect has a lot of uh, positive influences on the way you think. And because of that, there's actually been a movement called the positive psychology movement recently. It started mostly in about roughly the turn of the century, 2000 or thereabouts, and then different universities throughout the country, there are actually now centers of positive psychology where they study the benefits of being in a positive mood. Now, if you think in terms of adaptation, maybe evolution, you think, well, if positive affect has all these benefits, why, does, why might we be in a sad mood? Why are there any benefits to there or not? Because it seems relatively easy for the brain to simply shift to a constant positive mode of thought there must be some benefits to being in a negative mood as well. And in fact, more recently, there have been some studies which have shown that, in fact, negative moods can help you in certain ways. All right? Um, negative affect uh, helps you be more skeptical. People were given a, a set of facts, 25 were true, 25 were false, and they were told which ones were true and which ones were false. Okay? Two weeks later, they came back Half of them had positive affect induced, half of them had negative affect induced. The ones who had positive affect induced were more likely to say the things that they were told were false before were true because they used simply the fact that they recognized those items 
as being a, as indicator of true or falseness. Whereas those who had negative affect induced were more accurate as remembering which ones were true and which ones were false. There have been studies where people are watching videotapes of people either telling the truth or being deceptive about whether or not they took a movie ticket from a room when no one else was looking. These are people who were told, yes, take the ticket and lie about it, or no, don't take the ticket and lie about it. Okay? A different group of people watched videos of those first group of people, and they had to detect which ones were lying, which ones were telling the truth. Those who had positive affect induced were less likely to say that anyone was lying, and those who had negative affect induced were more likely to say some people were lying and they were more accurate in their determinations as well. Negative affect helps you resist misinformation. Okay? People, in this case participants, witnessed an altercation in a classroom setting. All right? A little while later, uh, they were asked questions like, do you remember when the woman in the beige jacket uh, pulled something out of her pocket? She wasn't wearing a beige jacket, but that was designed to give them misinformation. Okay? Then later on, they had either positive or negative affect induced, and they were quizzed about what happened at that original event. Okay? Those who had positive affect induced were more likely to report the misinformation as being true than those who had negative affect induced. And maybe one of the more powerful things is that negative affect makes you more persuasive. You write better arguments for things when you have had negative affect induced. And this was tested in a variety of ways, including people had affect induced, wrote arguments on a given issue, and those arguments were then given to another group of people entirely, and they measured how their attitudes changed as a result of reading those different arguments. People who had negative affect wrote better arguments. Okay? So as you can see, it's not a clear-cut thing. It's not always best to be happy, not always best to be sad or, or excited or you know, um, disgusted or whatever. So there are, there, are positive, there are reasons to be in both. But as far as being create, creative goes, positive affect leads to more creative thought, more out-of-bounds thinking and things of that sort. And it goes right back to what Peter Elbow was saying, that there are these two modes of thought that he saw them but since affect is a continuum, I suspect this is more of a continuum as well. But if you want to think creatively, uh, being in a happy mood really helps quite a bit in that process. And I also wanted to add a little bit about incubation. Uh, the person who first created or first had the model of the benzene ring, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know all the details, but supposedly he had the image in a dream where he uh, dreamed that a snake was biting its own tail. And then he woke up and wrote down all the implications for that as how benzene is structured in the, in the physical uh, level. Some people have actually questioned whether this is actually a true account or not. But there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that people in a very relaxed state who've been thinking about a problem for a while, the answer often pops into their head. So they might be falling asleep or just waking up. They might be showering or they might be taking a walk you know, through a park or something like that. But there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that that's very helpful, that you've set the problem up in your mind, and then you do something as relaxing as possible, and you're more likely to come up with a solution in those cases. For the last of my three uh, topics, I want to talk a little bit about teaching others, since I do that quite a bit, and I've thought an awful lot about it and read a lot about that as well. And one of the reasons why this is kind of important, at least in my mind, is back in May there was a discussion on RubyTalk. And somebody said, I would like to learn, a new, uh, learn how to program. I've never programmed before in my life. Is Ruby a good language to learn to program with? Okay? And I think I saw him here. Rick, I think you actually participated in this particular discussion, as I recall. And most people said, yeah, Ruby is a great language to start learning in. But a few people had oppositional viewpoints. And I'm not going to put their names here, but someone said, learn C first. The real, to really get programming, you need to understand what's going on. You need to go deep, all the way down to C. And some even say go down, going down to assembler. It doesn't make things easy for you, because you have to grab your own memory. You have to make your own, make and move your pointers to access memory. You've got to link your own binaries. And doing all of that makes you a better programmer, makes you understand what really is going on behind the scenes. Okay? 
Now, I don't doubt that knowing those kinds of things is useful, but the question is, what do you want to learn first? Okay? He's saying learn C first. And again, it's cut off here, but he ends it with a smiley face. You know, work hard, you'll, you'll uh, benefit from it. And he kind of uh, sands off the rough edges with a smiley face. Somebody else had a very similar view. That's exactly why we chose C as the first language for electronic engineering and information systems engineering students. C is very hard to learn. Almost everybody comes unstuck on pointers, memory allocation, and it keeps going on and on. But if the original poster wants good foundation in programming, C will provide it. But Ruby would be gentler. And again, there's that little smiley face at the very end of that. And somebody else had you know, a nice kind of over high level view of what the issue was that people were discussing. He said that traditionally, technical subjects are taught from the bottom up. Some people prefer a top-down approach, but it's more of an individual choice. Well, let's see, talk a little bit about data and what data kind of leads us to believe. Which of these three concepts do you think kids are most likely to learn first? OK. You're probably going to guess dog, all right? Dog is where kids learn first. Later on, they might learn poodle or mammal. But they're starting in the middle, and they be, learn the more abstract and the more uh, low-level concrete concepts later. What about in these three cases? OK. And again, probably chair. All right? And in these hierarchies of, of, of issues, from the abstract to the more concrete, a uh, researcher by the name of Eleanor Roche back in the 1970s did a lot of studies on how people categorize things. And she found that there's this level called the base level, which is where people uh, tend to categorize things first, understand things at the first. And they go for up and down from there. That's kind of the sweet spot. And then how is it the sweet spot? Well, that's the level where things are most easily grouped by overall shape visually. It's the level, the highest level, at which we interact with objects similarly. We interact with most chairs in the same way. We don't interact with all furniture at the same way. Tables we interact with one way, lamps a different way, and chairs a third way entirely. Okay? People are most likely to use base level names when having casual discussions. Base level names often have fewer syllables. And in fact, this even goes into American Sign Language. In American Sign Language, at the base level, there are typically single signs for those base level categories. And you're more likely to have, need a, um, a combination of signs for more abstract or less abstract things. All right? And children learn the base level first. OK? So when we think about programming, the base level might be things like statements, variables, flow of control, methods, objects, and so forth. Higher level concepts are things like software architecture, algorithmic efficiency, code complexity, or how beautiful your code is. We can also go down to lower levels as well, things like memory management, memory layout, pointers, and linking, and so forth. But where most programming is at, where you can kind of get the most power for the minimal amount of effort, is by first focusing on that base level and from there moving up to more abstract concepts and down to more concrete concepts. And that, in a nice way, is why Ruby is such a great language to learn with. Because you can start learning without having to write a single method. You can do put s hello world. In Java, you have to, at the very least, create a class and a method within the class. That's a static method. It's a public static method called main. All that stuff which you're going to have to push off as far as des describing what all that stuff is used for until they've gotten to more advanced topics. Okay? So that's why I think Ruby is a great first language. And the one last issue I want to discuss, and this is because the way people think and the way people program are a little bit different. Okay? Usually in programming, we think of uh, categories, and categories is how psychologists uh, refer to what we might call concepts, or what we might call classes even. But we think of, of, of concepts as having a, a nice border. Some things fit the concept, some things don't. Okay? This is either a dog or it's not a dog. It's a tree or it's not a tree, and so forth. Okay? So for example, how would you write a conditional in your language of choice, say Ruby, about whether or not somebody was a bachelor? Okay? Well, you start thinking, okay, what are the components of being a bachelor? 
It must be male, okay? They can't be a kid. They have to be, you know, maybe at least a, a teenager, right? And if they can't be married, of course, because, you know, bachelors are people who are not married yet, okay? So we're going to play a little game called Pick the Bachelor, all right? And I'm going to show you the picture of two people who millions of people regard very highly. They're both deceased now. And your job is to pick of these two which is the better bachelor. <laughs> okay? Now, Pope John Paul II, you know, fits the main criteria. He's male, he's not married, and he's old enough to be married. Okay? Whereas John F. Kennedy, you know, he's male, he's old enough to be married, but he is married, all right? But on the other hand, the concept of bachelorhood is not just those things. There's a lot of other stuff behind it. How somebody acts, for example. And as you probably all know, JFK has, there were rumors about him and Marilyn Monroe and so forth. He acted like a bachelor, where it's very hard to imagine Pope John Paul II acting in any way like that at all. So in a strange sense, JFK is the better bachelor of the pair, even though he actually violates some of the fundamental criteria of what being a bachelor is. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, imagine you're at a hardware store, all right? And now imagine a tool, okay? How many of you imagined a hammer? Okay, usually it's the majority of people imagine a hammer. Very rarely do people imagine a, an Allen wrench, for example, okay? Why is that? Well, back in, I think this was the 70s, it could have been earlier than that, People were working on prototype theory. Eleanor Roche was one of them, Michael Posner was another. But the idea is that categories are not these things with these hard-edged borders, all right? In fact, categories have a central tendency, which we tend to call the prototype, and they also have some extent, things that are further away from that prototype, which are still considered part of the category. But there's also some gray cases as well, things that May, maybe in some cases are part of the category, in some cases are not, okay? So we've got things that are definitely part of the category, uh, definitely not, some gray areas, and things that are right on the edge, which depending on the context, you might say yes or no on, okay? So with dogs, a golden retriever is, is very near the prototype. It might depend on which dog you had as a kid. You get to chows, you're a little bit kind of going out there, all right? And when you get to this dog named Sam, uh, that's probably kind of, you know, way, way, way out there. Sam is a three-time champion of winning the Ugliest Dog Competition at the Sonoma Marin Fair World's Ugliest Dog Contest. Um, he won three years running in a row and actually passed away, and someone else was finally able to, uh, to uh, claim the title. I suspect foul play, but anyway. <laughs> All right. How about these things? Are these things dogs or not dogs? On the left is actually a cross between a dog and a wolf. Dog or not. We've got toy dogs and we've got cartoon characters, which may or may not be dogs. Okay? So there are some of these, of these edge cases as well. When you want to teach somebody these concepts, you want to give them a sense of what the central tendency is and also the extent of it as well. And to do that, you give lots of examples. All right? Even if you never provide them with the the bullseye, the dead center of that category, they will, through lots of examples, they will actually infer it. And, and if they ever see that, that, that thing which is the perfect bullseye, they'll say, yes, that's the one, that's, per, that's about as near perfect as possible, even if they've never seen it before, because they've extracted the prototype from all the various examples. But the more examples, the better. So, conclusions. Let's kind of go through these big topics in reverse order. When you're teaching new concepts, teach at the base level first, and then you can move up or down from there. In order to give people a generalizable prototype that is as useful as possible, give them as many examples as, as you can. Even if you don't hit the prototype exactly, they'll infer it from all of the examples automatically. For creativity, mood, emotion, affect, whatever you want to call it, is important. Positive affect helps creativity, all right? Negative affect will help you with more careful and critical thought. And there's also the whole process of incubation. If you're working on something hard, get all the information into your mind, and then do something as relaxing as possible. And sometimes that'll help you resolve the issue. And as far as effectiveness goes, 
choose your environment. First of all, as best you can, avoid the distracting environments. Try to minimize multitasking. But if you feel at a deficit, spend some time in nature. Or even better, try to include nature as a regular part of your day-to-day -day activities or your weekly activities, and you'll be better for it. Okay? And that's everything. I want to give you all the slides with full citations on the website. It's not there yet, but in a few days it will be there. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me at the, anywhere else in the conference or send me an email. Thank you.